I killed two people. I killed two people. 13 years ago, I was 21 years old. On a dark and rainy night, I was driving a car that I had stolen. My adrenaline was mixing with the methamphetamines that were already in my system, and my heart was pounding against my chest as I looked into the rearview mirror. To my horror, I was looking at the red and blue lights of the police cars that were chasing me. All I could think about was getting away from them and getting home safe. Safe? How selfish of me to think of my own safety. Nevertheless, I raced down the highway, the buildings a blur. I was approaching the busiest intersection that I knew, and I couldn't stop. The light was turning red, I was going too fast, and the pavement was slick from the rain. The outcome of these events was that I caused a car crash. While being strapped onto a gurney in the ambulance, I was told that I had killed two people on impact. Through my hazy vision, the reality hit me. I killed two people. It was 3 a.m. on the morning of December 20th, 2001. I woke up extra early that morning, and I figured that it was because my mom and stepdad were arriving later that day to celebrate Christmas. I decided to take advantage of the time and make sure that all the decorations were up and the presents were wrapped. I'd only been up about an hour when I heard a knock on the door. It startled me since it was so early in the morning. When I went to the door and asked who it was, the male voice on the other side identified himself as a police officer. My first reaction was, what did I do wrong? When I opened the door and let him in the house, I will never forget the words that he said. He started by telling me that this was a part of his job that he hated. He then began to tell me that my mom and dad had been killed in a car accident. In confusion, I said, my mom and stepdad, or my dad and stepmom? He quickly clarified that my mom and stepdad had been killed in a car accident in Seattle. My life was forever changed at that moment. He provided me with a phone number and instructions to call the number as soon as possible. When I called the number, I learned that my mom and stepdad had been killed in a car accident as a result of a high-speed police chase. I learned that the girl that was responsible was in the hospital, and there had been no court date set. Everything became such a blur. Very quickly, I learned that the accident had been highly publicized in the media. All alone in jail with my mind clear of the drugs, I had an epiphany. For the first time in my life, I was terrified of my actions and fearful of the consequences. I understood that what I did was wrong. I felt such a magnitude of grief, pain, and sorrow. Now multiply that by 100, and that's probably how my victim's family felt. On the day of my arraignment, right after I had pled not guilty, I pulled out a handwritten letter of apology. My palms were clammy, the sweat was running down my sides as I began to read this agonizing letter. I was stopped by the judge and my lawyer and was advised not to go on. Against the advice I was given, I resumed reading that letter. I wanted my victim's family to know that I was remorseful and that I was not a cold-blooded killer. When I saw Michelle for the first time in court, I thought, a girl so young. She didn't look like a murderer. I couldn't tell which side of the courtroom had more friends and family. What happened that brought us all to this life-changing moment? I felt like I was in a dream, and I couldn't figure out what was reality and what wasn't. I remember Michelle entering a plea of not guilty, but then turning to the family and reading a letter of apology. I was confused. What was going on? Was she taking responsibility for her actions? 
At 21 years old, I was convicted of murder too and received an 18-year sentence. My mind couldn't comprehend the time that I was about to do. I came to prison broken, angry, and hurt. I had a bad attitude and a chip on my shoulder. Why should I listen to anyone? What did they know? Is there a light at the end of the tunnel? I pondered these questions. I continued to get into trouble for the first couple of years. When I learned that Michelle was changing her plea to guilty, I was relieved. This would be so much easier on the family to not have to go through a trial. But I couldn't help but wonder what were her motives. I remember the words that I spoke to Michelle very clearly that day. I looked at her and said, do not let my mom and stepdad's lives be lost for nothing. Become a better person before you get out. I had so many unanswered questions. In 2008, seven years later, I reached out to victim services. I was connected with a victim advocate who helped me navigate my journey to get my questions answered. After several sessions with the victim advocate, we decided that I was ready to come face to face with the person responsible for killing my mom and stepdad. The next step would be, to deter would be to determine whether Michelle was willing to meet with me. Willing to meet with me? This is an option for her? How could this be a choice? What if she said no? I knew I had to keep moving forward. So I began to write an introductory letter that would be hand delivered to Michelle. I was filled with dread when I was escorted by my counselor to the mental health services building. This could only mean that either someone had died or that I was in trouble. Instead, I was introduced to two people who were from victim services. They both stated they were there on behalf of a woman named Sheila, who turned out to be my victim's daughter. They had a letter from her. While reading this letter, I felt unsure and guarded, yet fortunate. I couldn't breathe. Ultimately, Sheila wanted to know if I would be willing to meet with her in person. Without hesitation, I said yes, straight from my heart. I knew that this was the least I could do for this woman. The wait to hear back with word of Michelle's decision seemed to take forever. When I received a call and learned that Michelle had agreed to meet with me, I was relieved. Yet there was a whole new wave of emotions that came over me. Fear, doubt, and questioning whether I really should and could do this. I continued forward, and I wrote another letter to Michelle to break the ice. Being able to write Sheila prior to our meeting was instrumental in helping me to prepare for one of the hardest obstacles I would have to overcome. I knew I would have to face this woman, look her in the eyes, and answer all of her questions. Sheila's second letter explained more of what she wanted from me, helping to ease my anxiety and calm my nerves. We were making progress. I wrote to her about all of my accomplishments in school, as well as what I had done as a Braille transcriber. I wanted Sheila to know that I was making better choices. Although the process seemed to take forever, I did live out of state and arrangements had to be made. And this was the first time a meeting of this type had taken place in the state of Washington. I made my travel arrangements and my dad agreed to come with me as my moral support. I laugh about it now because I took my dad completely out of his comfort zone and probably should have provided him with the moral support. <laughs> he did just what I needed him to. He was present. It was like having my own security blanket with me. When we entered the prison, a feeling of anxiety took over. 
we walked through the, the courtyard and we approached a building. As we approached the building, I was told that as soon as we go through the door, Michelle will be on the other side. I froze. My heart was racing. I couldn't breathe. I stopped. I took a deep breath. I closed my eyes and I refocused. And I reminded myself that I could never move on from this horrific loss if I didn't do this. Seven years into my incarceration, I was finally afforded the opportunity to meet with Sheila. Although I had been preparing for this for months, I still felt apprehensive and guarded. I hadn't slept in who knows how long, and to put it quite simply, I was a mess. I believed this woman would hate me. Instead, when Sheila walked through the doors and our eyes met, I felt a sense of composure. She asked the facilitators for permission to hug me. As we embraced, I knew this kind of humanity was extraordinary. The hug was astonishing, weird, and even awkward. But at that moment, it felt so right. During the course of our meeting, she asked questions about my life and how I grew up. She wanted to know about the night of the car crash, as well as what I had done while I was incarcerated. I answered all of her questions and told her about my plans for the future. What I thought would be a couple of hours turned into an entire day of clarity, confusion, and a whole lot of emotion. I met Michelle's sister, and Michelle met my dad. She learned more about who my mom and stepdad were and the impact that their deaths has had on family, friends, and acquaintances. We became very real people to each other on this day. Following our meeting, we stayed in touch through letters. Michelle followed through with a promise that she made me to make a quilt in honor of my mom that would be donated to the CASA program, which was a program that my mom volunteered with. Some time passed until a few months ago. I received a call from Victim Services letting me know that Michelle was trying to get a hold of me, that she wanted to participate in a project and wanted to talk about our story. I immediately contacted Michelle and I learned more about TEDx and the project that she wanted to participate in. I not only supported her participation, but agreed to collaborate as well. I don't want to be a person who lets anger, hatred, pain, and sadness rule my existence. I wasn't born an awful person. I made poor choices for myself. I ended up paying a stiff price, but I learned the most profound lesson of my life. Sheila has given me a new insight on living, and now I aspire to be more than ordinary or average. She is an awesome person. Through her actions, Sheila has shown me how to be strong, have courage, and to be selfless. Many letters, phone calls, emails, and a few trips later, here I am with an opportunity to further my healing by sharing my story and having my voice heard. This has not been an easy process. It has been overwhelming, challenging, stressful, and painful the entire way. I would never take it back. As a result of this, I know that I'm a better person, and I know that Michelle is as well. My questions have been answered, not in the media, not through someone else's viewpoint, but straight from Michelle, the person responsible. As I stand back and I look at the big picture, 
I see someone who took full responsibility for her actions from the very beginning. The girl that I saw 13 years ago was living a life of crime and drugs and made a very bad choice that will have a lifelong impact on many people. What I have grown to see is a woman who has paid a hefty price for her actions, who has made significant strides to become a better person, and someone who is determined to come out of prison, not just a different person, but an amazing person. Our call to action is bridging the gap between offenders and victims, which to me is bringing people together to work out their differences. This tool has allowed me to go through the process of self-forgiveness, to move down a path of healing, and to move forward with my life in a positive light. Owning the responsibility and taking accountability were necessary in beginning this long process of self-improvement. I believe everything happens for a reason. Sometimes we never find out what that reason is, but we have two options. You can either get on with living or get on with dying. Today, I make a conscious choice to live. I encourage any offender who is presented with this opportunity to take full advantage of it. I encourage victims and survivors to consider how this process might help you on your own personal journey, when and if you are ready. I fully recognize that this is not an easy process. Until now, I have never truly understood the meaning of forgiveness and moving on. If I could do it, Maybe you could too. Thank you.